Hey, 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 everybody, what's going on? Welcome to episode 21 of Climbing the Ladder. I'm your host, Chan Man V. I hope everybody's having a great Tuesday afternoon. Uh, joining me, as always, is John Clark, uh, it's executive director of, <laughs> I always forget, executive director of operations at, at CSN. How's it going, John? It's going great. Awesome. Uh, Mark, usually Mark Faraz joins us, you know, CEO of Quantic Gaming, but um, he might be joining us a little bit later today. I'm, not, I'm actually not completely sure yet because I haven't gotten a hold of Mark today, but hopefully he'll be joining us. Uh, today we've got two great you know, special guests, uh, two guys that I think a lot of folks in the community know. Uh, first off, we have J.P. McDaniels, caster and uh, content producer and of shows such as, you know, really popular shows such as Save the Game and Real Talk. How's it going, J.P.? It's going good, man. How's it going for you? Good, good, good. And lastly, we got uh, C, uh, Chief Operating, uh, oh, Chief, uh, golly, Chief Operations uh, Officer and uh, and co-owner of Complexity Gaming, Jason Bass. How's it going, buddy? Good. How are you? Good, good. Man, I'm getting tongue-tied today. It's like weird. Uh, all right, folks. So, uh, what you guys been up to? Well, Jason, I've been trying to stay. Cool over here. What's it like down there in Houston, man? <laughs> it's really hot in Dallas. I haven't adjusted yet. We had a nice cool front uh, yesterday. They dropped it down to like 86, so you know, got us out of the hundreds. That was nice. Bad. It's not bad. Yeah. So yeah, Jake, I'm just uh, well, go ahead. I was just gonna say you 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 were you were in Texas before, right? You just recently moved to Dallas, right? Yeah, I, I find Dallas to actually be a little bit hotter than than uh, where I was in Galveston. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just being picky. But other than that, I've uh, just kind of been getting settled with the new house. Um, a week after I moved here, I had uh, MLG Raleigh, so mm -hmm. I went to that, and I didn't really even get a chance to fully move in. So I, I think I'm actually moved in now, and, and kind of getting back to the the content grind, I guess. So yeah, good stuff. I've definitely caught a few of your shows recently, which are uh, been amazing. The Artosa show was great, man. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. All right, so let's start off the show with you know what we typically do, which is um, kind of talk about any kind of misconceptions in the industry and you know try to clear those up. And uh, I kind of want to start off with you, uh, JP and Jason, to see if there are there any kind of things kind of running prevalent, you know, misconceptions running prevalent in the community that maybe uh, you know maybe you can address. Jason, feel free to start, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> it's always a, it's always fun. Yeah. It's such a wide open or random question. Mm -hmm. uh, misconceptions. Uh, it can be, in, it can be know, in any segment, you know, whether it's team seg you know, team ownership segment or w anything. Nothing is popping into my head. I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, yeah, you've, you've caught me at a loss at this point in time. No problem, JP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess one is that uh, the money in esports is is few and far between that uh, companies like MLG and, and DreamHack and even a bunch of the teams aren't really actually making any profit. Uh, the majority of them are, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't speak for them specifically, but they're, they're not doing so well as, as I think everyone believes them to be. Uh, the events that, that a lot of these people put on cost millions and millions of dollars. So when, when you do that and, and you look at how many they put on a year and, and how much they actually get back from that, obviously no one's going to ever release the real numbers, but uh, it it is very. I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions right now is that people are millionaires at this day and age in esports, and it's very very far from it. Um, well, it's obvious, maybe, that, it's obvious that Sir Scooch is a millionaire. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scott Scott is one of the the, the few, uh, right. I guess you could say. But there there are people that are doing very well, but I can probably count all of them on my on one hand. Um, mm -hmm. It it's very very hard still uh, in this business right now too. Uh, kind of make make a good living for yourself. So I think that's one misconception. Uh, that's one I can agree yeah. with. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, I, I can definitely say that most companies in this uh, industry are probably one partner away from being out of business, i.e. if one of the major sponsors drops them, that, that literally could be another business. You know, that would be uh, not surprising to me and something that I could see happening to us and lots of other people, honestly. Uh, I, I mean, I still work a quote unquote real job and uh, this is still a side gig for me I mean we do we do okay in, the, in esports terms for for uh, uh, as far as complexity goes but you know there's a long way to go this industry has a long way to go and I, I've seen the light at the end of the tunnel this 
past two years with StarCraft II and League of Legends and some of the other games, but uh, mm-hmm. we still have a long way to go. I mean, there's a lot of this, you know, you made a good point about just, you know, being one partner or one sponsor, of course, Mark Johnson, <laughs> uh, being one partner away from, you know, things just kind of falling apart for folks. Um, is that because of reinvestment of, you know, revenue and, and, and any profits, or is it just because, like, really the prof- just the margins are really non-existent or, or just very, very small at this point? <clears throat> I think we're all still trying to grow very organically right now, and so I, I know I can speak personally for ourselves that when more money rolls in, when we sign a new sponsorship, and we we signed uh, Gamma, and what did we do? We, we we went and got the house going, and, and honestly, that house more than <coughs> offsets what Gamma pays us uh, a year. So we we're reinvesting and trying to get a bigger footprint in the space, and I think that most companies are, are doing the same thing. I mean, even companies that are viewed as, you know, crapping money like EG, I, I know that they run pretty close to the vest because they do a lot of reinvestment in their brand, a lot of reinvestment in their players, mm-hmm. and a lot of reinvestment in their marketing, their activities. So I think we're all doing the same thing. I see. Okay. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hey, how are you? Good. Gotcha. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> you got your camera going? or? No, I don't. actually I don't have my camera hooked up right now. I've been moving stuff around. So. Uh, okay, no problem. No problem. All right, so uh, let's, uh, I guess, uh, John, you have anything? or? Uh, I don't know. I, it'd be interesting to touch on that even more. I know we've talked about it in the past, but, um, you know, you know, both JP and Jason said it. it it's true. It's a, a lot of, and I would say that it's a lot more teams and then large organizations that run online, ev- uh, that run live events that are really that one sponsor away from, taking a dive just simply because their revenue stream is 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 very specific to the amount of sponsors that they that they have on board uh, I think that in the industry there are some and there will continue to be more people or organizations that are looking to find an actual revenue stream something in which continues to pay um, you know it's one thing to ask for donations or to to take uh, you know, Twitch subscriptions, but uh, there has to be ways in which uh, in this industry we can continue to make revenue. Like, for instance, EG, they can continue to have sponsors, but where does the revenue come from? Like, where do they actually generate revenue? They, they can pinpoint and say, hey, this is where money comes in each month, so we have to up these numbers or do something differently here. Um, I can tell but you But I think you'll start from. to see more of that. You can? Yep. Oh, do. Please tell. Fans. Fans. Yep. Okay. That's right. Cause it, those those are the people who are who reaping the entertainment value that we're producing. Right. I and completely then, agree with Mark. We have yep. to monetize the the fan base, and, and uh, I think a lot of people are uh, scared to do that and are not ready mm-hmm. to to jump on that bandwagon. They think it's some sort of horrible thing to treat this like every other industry that has a fan base. And <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that we need to fleece them dry, but you know, yeah. we do need to monetize that fan base. Right. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's more the the community is. Uh, I, I don't know. I've always felt like the community is is very wary of jumping in like that, even if it's two or three dollars for for something. Uh, I mean, there wasn't. It's was probably a year ago, or even maybe a little bit more than that, when GSL was uh, putting up yearly subscriptions, and there were posts on Reddit and Team Liquid that spanned for hundreds of pages of how it was crazy that someone was going to pay. 60 bucks for a year's worth of content from GSL, which is like four or five nights a week yeah. of four to five hours of content, and people were upset about that. Like, I, that, it didn't make sense to me at the time, and I think the community now has kind of figured it out that, well, that's actually a really, really cheap price for what, uh, what you're getting there. So, uh, I, I think as time kind of goes on, that it, it, re- it relies on companies and, and, uh, kind of figureheads to start doing things. Uh, like that to to kind of make the community see and, and lighten up about it. So we're we're getting there, but it, it's going to take a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, everyone jumped on MLG in the beginning for their pay per view, and and even though I was actually, you know, I was I'm for the idea. I was definitely not for it the first time they did it in regards to how they did it, but I'm definitely for the idea. Um, and I think people are becoming accustomed to the fact that you're going to have to start to pay for content. I mean, you we don't all work for free. Well. Some of us don't, but. 
Well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, it's a quandary we actually got into at Gottfrag. I mean, this was many, many years ago. You know, we had a million yeah. people come into our website, and it was, uh, you know, the revenue was solely based on sponsorship and, and advertising dollars, and we were never monetized in the community. So we came out with the premium prime concept where we charge $6 a month for prime content, and we got massive backlash. I mean, it was, it was something that provided some extra revenue, but it certainly didn't get... Uh, to the even 1% of our audience that we were hoping that it would get to. And that was optional content too, which is crazy. Like people were right. bitching about premium content that you didn't actually have to read that was there as an option and then they still right. bitched about it, which I mean, yeah. I, I guess yeah. that we've grown from that, but it's just well, I it's think silly. It's, well, I don't know if we've completely grown. I think it's still taboo for, uh, you know, it's a taboo to make money. It's a taboo to charge someone. Uh, for content still. I mean, I, I think we've gone a long ways, but uh, I still feel like, especially in the StarCraft II community, they're very, very specific, very picky about what they're willing to pay for, which is actually not a bad thing because it increases the production value, but uh, I think overall um, people are starting to see that you got to pay, you do have to pay for content and for, you know, premium subscriptions and things like that. I'm hoping that's the case because that's I mean, the bottom line we're going to make revenue. The bottom line is, is that if advertisers were willing to pay more, then we wouldn't have to charge the fans. <laughs> but that's just that's just a fact. The advertisers right. aren't willing to pay more. Right. If they were. But, so how much of the um, how much of the um, I guess the pushback for this do you think has to do with just the demographics of you know the demographics that we're working with, which a lot of folks I don't you know how much of it is true or not. A lot of folks really perceive it as you know college students or people just right out of college that don't have much money. Uh, I mean, it's definitely true. I, th I think that uh, the 18 to 25 demographic that we're in is has a big reason for that. Um, and, and maybe we're just kind of waiting till that demographic kind of grows up, gets family, has a, a stable job and whatnot, and then we'll start seeing, uh, we'll start reaping the benefits. But maybe that's just a pipe dream that I have. I, I don't know. Time will kind of only have to tell. No, I don't think it's a pipe dream at all. I think time time is exactly what we need and if we get too far ahead of ourselves um, we may end up down the same road that we that we did before which is why Gottfrag is no longer around and CS isn't as big and you know there was a whole other scene at one point of the very same stuff that we're dealing with now and there was a reason that it just all went to shit it wasn't just the economy but I think I think we got ahead of ourselves but I think time will tell and as as we all get older well as most of you all get older <clears throat> I'm already old but uh, as as the demographic starts to get older, their children and uh, will be investing in esports, and we'll just continue to see a cycle where people are continuing to put money into it, like it's you know like it's normal. I mean, I've been doing this for twelve to fifteen years now, and I've seen lots of uh, ups and downs. But I mean, what what John just mentioned there, I mean, that was I blame Championship Gaming Series Directv mm -hmm. for the entire crash of that last bubble. Uh, I mean, that's the whole reason why I went to work for them, because I truly, when they announced it one year before I went to work for them, I said to myself, this is going to either make or break us. I think it's too soon. We haven't grown big enough organically for them to jump in and spend this kind of money. But if somebody from our industry doesn't go over there and help them, then we're in trouble if it falls apart. I went mm -hmm. there, I worked for one year, and I said uh, after one year they weren't listening, they weren't listening to anybody that knew anything about gaming, and so I left. And it fell apart six months later, not because I left, but just because I knew it was going to fall apart. And DirecTV the plug, and that's what really crashed the United States esports bubble. Yeah, it took a lot of people with it because there was a lot of people that jumped on that bandwagon too, and then said, "Well, this definitely doesn't, this isn't going to work." And then they they just got out of it, and people, you know, sponsors got got weary of and you know of what was going to happen, and people just started dropping like flies. It was it was nuts. I agree with you that I think they had a huge play, a, you know, a huge role in why why we kind of had to start over. Jason, I never thanked you for uh, bringing me on CGS and then telling me you're quitting on the same day. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it really man, that, that hard. same day? <laughs> it, it was the it was at the Austin uh, the Austin draft for I guess season two is what it was. Yeah, yeah. I was really excited to be there. And then I started kind of hearing things, and you came up to me. He's like, "Yeah, I'm leaving CGS <laughs> next week." I'm like, Okay, that's cool. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you guys definitely have you know mentioned in some of y'all's uh, 
you know, kind of background in esports. And why, why don't we kind of delve into that and get some specifics? Because uh, a lot of folks out here, you know, really don't know, especially you, JP. I don't think everybody knows, like, I guess, you know, what you've what you've done in esports before. Um, uh, you know, the StarCraft, uh, the StarCraft scene. So uh, why don't we start with you, JP? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of it actually, uh, probably all of it has to do with, with Bass uh, and Gottfrag. Yep. I started uh, working there as a, uh, well, I guess volunteering there as a writer for the uh, D-pad section of Gottfrag, which was kind of their console um, console portion of the website where they didn't cover Halo 2 or anything at that point. Uh, I started out doing game reviews. Uh, I think it was, I think my first one was like Kingdom Hearts or something or something silly like that. Because uh, I, I was I was a journalism student at the time uh, in college, and uh, kind of time progressed forward. I I I'd played a lot of Halo, but uh, I, I followed MLG pretty closely uh, in the Halo scene at that time, and kind of started doing coverage with that. Um, the esports portion of Got Frag, Jason, Lee Chen, Chiban, and, and Mark Turner kind of noticed that um, it was picking up a little bit of uh, viewership there, so brought me over, and I think the big was it QuakeCon? Was that the first big event that I did coverage for, Jason? I think so. It was either QuakeCon or CPL with uh, Mark Turner and Slasher. Uh, when Slasher actually worked at Gottfrag, that was the first time meeting him. Um, he was a lot younger, had a lot more hair, obviously. A lot and, more uh, hair. That was, that was a fun... <laughs> yeah, he had more hair than he, he did, wow, okay. and most people know. Um, that was the first event that I kind of worked. Uh, I was a score grunt at the time, which uh, was basically just data input um, for three or four days straight, but I was at a QuakeCon, so it was, it was, it was amazing, because I had been to QuakeCons before, um, more as a, more as kind of like a fun thing, but now I was viewing it as work, um, so it, it kind of picked up from there, I started doing more feature articles, uh, doing interviews and whatnot, and then eventually, right before uh, Gottfrag was acquired by MLG, probably about, I don't know, two or three weeks prior um, and, and I had known for a while, probably six months, that it was coming. Um, I got a opportunity from uh, GMP Games Media Properties, which was the parent company of WSVG, the World Series of Video Games, to uh, come and be a, a writer and managing editor for a new site they were building along with Sam Lingle, who I don't know if it's kind of a name of, of esports past, but a uh, very, very good writer and still is today. Um, to kind of work underneath him and, and produce content for Amped Esports and, and eventually Game Right. So I launched that site. Uh, was there for probably about a year. Ended up quitting. Uh, did some work for CGS and kind of back and forth with a bunch of, of freelance jobs. Then eventually landed a gig at MLG. So that's a short term version of it. <laughs> uh, how about you, Jason? I mean, I know you've kind of you know been big, you know, kind of a big role in esports and they kind of just, you know, de definitely, you know, I exited out of esports and then now you've come back with a relaunch of complexity. So, um, oh, yeah. I never exited. I mean, that's, that, oh. that's the misconception. Okay. I, I've kind of been, and JP can attest to this and lots of people can who, who've worked mm -hmm. with me over the years. I've kind of been, you know, I, I've had a big hand in esports. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to lie, but it's always been in the background and it's never been in front of the camera or, you know, with public, uh, recognition or anything like that, and that's kind of, I, I don't, I, I've never minded that, so that's just kind of where I've been, but I, I started, I was a Counter-Strike player, I mean, I was uh, semi-pro before there was really a pro scene, played with the K-Sharps and Bullseyes of the World on my clan, but uh, I, I went to, uh, I started writing predictions for Cal Maine when I was in Cal Maine, and I got noticed by Gottfrag fairly early on into their uh, launched probably about three months in something like that, and I've always been one of the more older people in the scene. So uh, I quickly moved up the ranks at Gottfrag to the point where I was uh, pretty much second in charge, reporting to Lee Chen and, and, and manage the day-to-day -day operations of of Gottfrag. And uh, you know, I did that for I don't know five years or something like that. And when the MLG buyout came down the pipe, uh, like JP said, we knew it was coming for a long time. I knew it was coming even longer than that, but I, I got the offer to go be a GM at uh, the Championship Gaming Series uh, for the Dallas Venom, who, who Alex Conway ended up actually being the GM for. But I had a decision to make. Did, did I want to go work for MLG, or did I want to go work for DirecTV? And it really wasn't about, uh, you know... For me, it really wasn't about MLG versus DirecTV. It was about, I, my feeling was, 
MLG is fairly well established, and, and they're they're doing their own thing, the console thing, all that kind of stuff. And and, and Directv is coming directly into my space, and uh, in my area of expertise. And I was scared, like I said earlier, that if they didn't listen to people in the community, that it was just going to fall flat on its face, and it would be disastrous for us all. So I went over there, and I started a few weeks before the other GMs. I was helping uh, uh, the front office, I mean the back office uh, CGS folks kind of launched their website and, and get things going there. And then they offered me the director of marketing position during that time. And I, I honestly, that's where they wanted me all along, but I told them that I, I wanted to kind of step out into the limelight and, you know, do something different. And that's why I took the GM position. But uh, the more that I worked with them for that three to four weeks before the GMs reported duty, the more I realized that if somebody like not necessarily just me, but somebody that like Jason Lake or Craig Levine or, or somebody who's been influential and has been here and lived in the breed this is not in an influential position in the company and not just simply a GM, uh, that, that we're going to be in big trouble. So I went ahead and accepted that position because I felt like I could make a bigger impact for our sport uh, by being in the back office. And <clears throat> I killed myself for about a year, working about 100, 120 hours a week, launching 17 prop websites and brands and doing all sorts of different stuff behind the scenes. And, and uh, they brought on a, a few, I'll just, I won't name names, but fairly bureaucratic people at CGS that uh, tried to really staff up and immobilize us where we needed to be fast and nimble in startup mode. We, everybody was afraid to make a decision, and they just weren't listening to me. So I put in my notice right around the second season draft, like uh, JP said, and uh, I went back to my quote-unquote real job, uh, marketing and oil and gas software. And uh, shortly after I left, I, I went and joined Sevo. I worked for Sevo as they're uh, in their marketing role for uh, quite a while, and then when CGS fell apart, I made the offer, Jason Lake and I have been good friends for a long time, I just made the offer to help him out, uh, meaning I would help him try to land a couple of sponsors and, and you know, just be a friend in his time of need, so to speak. Well, he comes back to me the next day and says, hey, I want you to own the company with me and run it with me, and I, I said, uh, that's not really what I had in mind, man, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it all worked out, and I, I think everything happens for a reason, and I'm, I'm happy with the place that we're at. We've done some good things here. We've got a long way to go, but we've come an uh, incredible distance over the last uh, couple of years. All right, excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, I think uh, that's you know it's great having you guys you know obviously walk through that and um, but you know I think at this point I wanted to um, before we kind of delve in even further I guess with each of you guys um, and just what you guys are working on right now currently in esports uh, I wanted to bring up one kind of just uh, you know thing in the news like uh, I guess yesterday and kind of it, it kind of pertains to, I guess marketing in general in esports and uh, the the thing I wanted to bring up was really the IGN ban uh, from Reddit and. It's not so much talking about IGN what they did and all that. Stuff. I mean, it's not really about that. I want to talk about. Really, I just wanted to see, like, how do you think that is going to affect, um, you know, IGN and IPL in particular, and what do you guys think the importance of being able to market on Reddit is right now? Uh, I mean, I guess I'll go ahead and start off. Reddit is, at least for me, in, in terms of uh, content producers, probably one of the biggest driving forces for any content that I um, make. It, it, it's not. It's it's pretty easy to get top 10 or, or top 5 on uh, on a subreddit, but on things like our gaming and um, League of Legends subreddit especially, it's it's very, very big for uh, NMLG and IPL uh, whatever to get on there. Um, it, it really, really drives viewers to whatever you're, whatever you're doing. So for IGN, that's probably going to be, be a big blow. Not to IGN proper, but IPL specifically. Um, but I, I think that they'll kind of work through it. it it's shitty that it happens. It, it's kind of a uh, a very common thing within uh, giant media conglomerates like that to have bots. It it sucks that IPL or IGN. I'm sorry, got caught, but it sucks for IPL kind of down the trickling down. But I think they'll they'll figure something out and they'll be they'll be okay. Yeah, I think like JP said that it's uh, much more important for IPL. I mean, IGN does insane amounts of direct traffic, and I, I don't think that uh, they're going to suffer as much, but. IPL really needs the subreddits for, for traffic and, and just 
for notifying people that something's happening because they do put out a lot of content and it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on. So mm -hmm. uh, Reddit was a good place to do that. So I think that's really going to affect what they're doing over at IPL. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, next topic I wanted to go over is really, so I'm going to start doubling into kind of each of you guys. And we'll, we'll start with you, JP. And I kind of wanted to get a sense of what got you into, you know, really content you know, production and, you know, creating your shows, in particular State of the Game being, uh, I think, it, State of the Game was your first show, right? Uh, first show for StarCraft. Uh, okay. Arena Cast was actually a, a World of Warcraft show that I produced. That okay. was kind of one of the, the, the jackasses, I guess you could say, in this day and age that uh, <laughs> got WoW where it is in terms of being a competitive game. Obviously, Blizzard's probably the biggest driving force there, but mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a couple articles, some... I think the first article on, on Godfrag and, and esports in general. Um, and I'd always been a fan of um, like podcasts, One Up Radio. I, I don't know if anyone listens to a bunch of podcasts, but I listen uh, to a ton of uh, different ones. One Up Radio, uh, GFW Radio was also one of my favorite. Um, nowadays, I listen to the Joe Rogan podcast and things like that. Yep. And uh, I, I noticed that kind of in the esports space, there wasn't really any. And it, it was kind of. Um, uh, I guess I ironic, maybe interesting that uh, this basically the same week that I started Arena Cast as a WoW podcast was the same week that Live on Three started uh, over at CGS with Wheat and uh, oh I forget the other person's name, but <laughs> it used to be a completely different show than what it is now. Right. And uh, we both kind of started doing those shows um, right around the same time. Uh, he might have started maybe a, a tiny bit. Uh, prior to me, he'd probably get upset if I said that I started first. But uh, StarCraft Two came around. Uh, I started jumping into a lot of uh, content over there, producing the uh, the MLG Showcase series with uh, Mark Turner. Um, just I, I wasn't full time or anything with MLG. In fact, I didn't get any money uh, for any of the the stuff that I did back then. And uh, made friends with uh, with Day Nine pretty quickly, kind of using the MLG brand to. Uh, gain access to him um, at the time, and uh, I figured you know we sh maybe we should do a podcast. There's really nothing in the scene right now, uh, and he he was very uh, open to it. So I think the first episode was myself, Day Nine, Louder, and Artosis, and I think Louder and Artosis were there because they were the first uh, showcase series match that we had. It was Artosis versus Louder. I think Louder ended up winning two zero. The maps were terrible. Our justice was pretty pissed off, but we decided let's kind of do a, a podcast around it. And it started off audio only around episode 30-ish. We started doing video. Um, Jeff actually wasn't on the show until probably episode 9 or 10, maybe two or three months after I started it. And uh, he kind of fell into place uh, around the time we started doing video, as well as Tyler. And uh, that's kind of where we got the, the core group of Day9, myself, um, Tyler and Jeff, and then Artosis kind of launched in uh, once we, we took a break back in probably a year ago, around the same time that it is now. So I think that a lot of the content that I do comes from uh, things that I kind of look at the scene and, and see that it's lacking. Um, yeah. And then once I'm kind of, once it's, once it's up and running, uh, I, I kind of lose interest in it almost and start doing something else. Um, and that's that's kind of where Real Talk came from, where I had been doing interviews. I, I love doing interviews at Gottfrag. In fact, the Bass, I'm sure you remember this. The first interview that I, I kind of did that was big was an interview with uh, Matt Ringel from WSVG. And uh, I remember that I sent him the questions, and I didn't really go through Lee Chen or, or uh, through Bass and got in a lot of trouble for it because the questions were pretty... Hard hitting, and uh, Ringle didn't like it. He called Lee and was like, "What? What the hell? Like, what? Why is this guy asking me this?" Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that that was kind of fun, and I think that's kind of where Real Talk came from. Uh, the first episode was with Wani. Uh, it was pretty much a test episode. I, I think that a lot of the shows that I do from now on will be the the pilot episode will have no graphics or anything, and that kind of allows me to see what it is I need for the show and what it is if it's going to work in the first place, so I don't spend too much time on it, but. That's kind of where state of the game came from. I see. So, what is the current state like right now with state of the game? I mean, is it is it going to be? Because I think I think last time or you know semi recently you mentioned that it's going to start becoming more regular. 
And, um, you know, the guys are going to, I mean, it was always been a scheduling issue, obviously, because you have like some of the biggest names in the industry and they're super busy. But right. I know a lot of folks, at least watching this kind of would, would love to know, uh, if state of the game is going to be coming back on pretty, you know, weekly soon here. Sure. So I kind of knew this question was going to come, <laughs> come eventually. Right. Um, <laughs> Back in January, we uh, January or February, I forget, it was PAX East. Um, we were approached by uh, a corporation and was basically kind of went into talks with them and still in talks with them today. Um, when you deal with a, a corporation kind of this size, it takes a very, very long time for uh, things like legal, things like contracts and all that have to be drawn um, a lot of people don't understand that kind of every day I am working on State of the Game, but it's very, very slow because a lot of the things that I'm doing on my end, or a lot of the things that need to be done aren't on my end, uh, and, and when they are on my end, I get them done in a day or two. Uh, but right now, it's actually not in my hands. Uh, we're waiting on a bunch of other, um, other things to kind of fall into place, uh, and I, I have no timeline for that. Um, I, I said that the show would be back at the end of August, and here it is. Uh, now 9-11, right. um, and, and I'm, I'm done making time frames for people. I'm, I'm done trying to kind of satisfy their their need for the, the show. Um, but it, one thing I will say is there's a billion other podcasts out there, guys. Like, go watch something else and stop asking me about it. Cause <laughs> when I get tweets, it, it it's not infuriating. It's like, it's shitty. But, yeah, the, the stream just went offline, by the way. <laughs> Twitch just did a bunch of updates today. I'm sure it has something to do with that. Right. They uh, they made it faster and better. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what they there. said. All right, give me a sec. Is it back up? Give me a second. Hold on a sec. I think it's back. Well, it's kind of back up. Yeah, it looks like it's back up. JP, I just tweeted you, uh, so about when the start of the game is going to come back. <laughs> I, I get tweets from everyone. I get PMs that are like two thousand words long, and I'm just like, guys. JP, is this, is this new venture going to be? Uh, I don't know, kind of in line with what you were doing before. Or are you just not able to say right now? Uh, in, in what sense? Are, are you talking about MLG or? Well, I mean, you didn't mention the company that has approached you and that you're working with. Um, is this going to be some sort of uh, state of the game type show, or what is this? Are you just working on something that's kind of taking your time away from state of the game? I guess oh, I uh, st there. state of the game will be the same exact show uh, that it that it always kind of was uh, with with the new uh, the new sponsorship. Um, right now, I've kind of put all my focus into uh, real talk, uh, driving kind of everything to my Twitch channel and, and kind of trying to live off the s subscribers there and also off of YouTube doing content on that. Um, State of the Game will be back when it's back. Uh, in fact, I, I probably want it back more than anyone because it is the, the biggest show that I do and in terms of that, probably the biggest revenue uh, maker that I do, especially with the New Deal. Um, but like I said, I, I don't know when it's going to be ready. Um, I, I hope that <laughs> this is probably going to piss a lot of people off, but I hope that we're up and running by the end of 2012. Uh, hmm. We'll see. It's there's it's it's a lot of different contracts that I'm going through right now, and uh, a lot of headaches, kind of day to day, um, with uh, the things kind of in, involved in all of that. So it's a right. pain in the ass. But I, I think once the show gets up and running, that we won't ever have a downtime. Uh, kind of the biggest downtime in the show's history that we're that we're seeing right now. Okay, that kind of leads into the next uh, topic or question that we had in regards uh, with you, at least is is the love hate relationship with the community. Um, and I'm not quite sure exactly what Chris meant by this. Uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate, Chris, but um, go ahead. You were, uh, yeah, I was you muted. Were yeah. muted. Sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, so this love-hate relationship, it's, it's all about, um, you know, really, particularly Reddit, I think. Um, just, we talk a little bit about Reddit being, 
you know, sometimes, you know, full of a bunch of haters and can be a cesspool at times. And I know, JP, you're, you're one of the type of folks that aren't one of the type of folks that ignore it. Like, um, you know, I've heard like day nine, you know, day nine never reads any of that stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there are other folks like Jeff, you know, in control that's totally, you know, immerses himself into it, in it. And you're kind of in between, but, you know, I, I know you've had some frustrations with it too. So I kind of wanted to, to talk to you a little bit about that and, um, you know, how, what, you know, how you kind of feel about interacting with the community in that, that regard. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. I, I think that, uh, I think everyone reads it. There's no way not to read it. I mean, people are obviously talking about you. You want to see what they're saying. Uh, whether people say they don't read it, they have someone else read it for them. Um, mm. Everyone reads criticism from from Reddit, from Team Liquid, and whatnot. Um, I, I've probably been not one of the biggest. I, I'm very outspoken about it uh, from time to time. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the one that that I guess. Uh, affected me the most was definitely when uh, was uh, the last BlizzCon, uh, mm-hmm. casting the finals and whatnot. Uh, it actually got into the top ten of of all of Reddit, um, and it was uh, I think it was a thread about casting, like why is JP casting BlizzCon or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and ever since then, to be honest, I a lot of the cr- criticism in there was kind of constructive. I I tried to adjust. Uh, um, things that I did in my casting because of that, um, and eventually I, I kind of figured out that casting isn't really what uh, what I can do for this community. So I stepped down kind of full time. I, I probably won't cast any uh, any big events soon. In fact, I turned down a, a probably the biggest event of the year, um, not about a week or two ago, because I, I felt like it would probably do more harm than good, um, even if it was a, shri- a, a trip to Shanghai. So uh, the love hate community is is definitely. It's there. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably a good thing that it's there. Um, if everyone was positive and, and everyone was um, enjoying everything that everyone did, then it would probably be even harder for a lot of shows to uh, kind of make a name for themselves Where in an industry where the content uh, on a daily basis is staggering. I mean, there's, there's probably 50 or 60 hours of content uh, put out that's probably on the low end too. That's probably a low estimation yeah. uh, a day just from people out there, and no one can watch that. I mean, that's that's probably just games played. Uh, factor in all the shows, you're probably over a hundred easy. Um, so I, I think that while it sometimes I may kind of hate the the, the Reddit community, or it seem like I hate the Reddit community, but it, it's there for a reason, and I think it, it definitely fulfills a purpose, maybe a hidden purpose that not a lot of people see. Um, that I've kind of figured out as, as times kind of move forward and I've seen the effect on, on what it does to, to content producers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you enjoy, I mean, do you enjoy casting? I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, for me, it's, I hate to see you have to do that. You know, like if you, if you really do enjoy casting and you, you're, you're making that decision for, you know, for the sake of the community, hopefully people understand that and appreciate that. But I, you know, I kind of want to see if, like, do you actually enjoy it? And, you know, you're basically making a sacrifice, I mean, a huge sacrifice uh, for the sake of this. Uh, I mean, casting's always been, I think I said this earlier, a lot of the stuff that I do is, is more out of necessity in the sense that uh, my first cast was for the MLG Showcase series. It was with Day 9, and that was the first time I had ever casted anything. Um, I had watched a lot of stuff uh, with DJ Weed and Corey Dunn and um, kind of back in the day, too good. Uh, Brett uh, did a bunch of deep WSVG stuff, and um, I, I had kind of seen, so I had somewhat of an idea. But uh, I don't even know if the vods are still up for that that stuff that we did almost two and a half years ago. But um, it's pretty bad, and uh, I think that I I kind of grew rapidly. I was put on a pretty big stage uh, right after that when Sean invited me uh, to do his. Um, like at the Wings of Liberty, the the Day Nine launch party, that's what it was called. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was kind of the the biggest stage at the time, and uh, it went pretty well. I, I thought that that was a pretty good cast. Uh, that was the first time I had ever been in an audience. That was definitely nerve wracking. Um, kind of another role that I filled at, at MLG is in terms of necessity was uh, was this kind of host role, was introducing players and whatnot. Now everyone really does it. Um, Clutch obviously took over the reins on that, and he's miles better than I was. Um, and that was that was also incredibly nerve wracking too for the first time, kind of stepping out on stage in front of this huge sea of nerds out there and, and kind of introducing the players for the first time. And that was a lot of fun. Um, 
if I enjoy doing it, to answer your question directly, I think that it has its its time and place. Casting is a lot drain a lot more draining than people actually realize. Um, in fact, our, kind of to say what Artosis said, uh, he was doing three or four days, uh, or sorry, he does three or four days over at GSL with Tasteless, and he uh, he gets pretty tired by the fourth day. It, it's it's pretty draining, um, and I think the only people that will ever really understand that are the casters themselves, because a lot of it has to do with travel, um, and, and we don't actually. A lot of the casters probably don't take care of themselves as well as we should be in terms of our voice and, and how much we're actually sleeping on, on these events because we're probably on four or five hours asleep each night over an event, maybe even less than that. So um, casting, do I enjoy it right now? Not really. It's not a big, uh, a big thing for me. In the industry, it's probably the number one thing that I could make money doing, um, but at the end of the day, kind of leaving MLG, I, I don't know if it would be right, or at least it wouldn't feel right for me. I'd feel very awkward if I was casting an IPL or an ASL or any of the other events out there um, outside of MLG. I don't know if I if it's been long enough to kind of differentiate myself from the MLG brand. So, I see. So, um, any plan? I mean, right now, obviously, you're you're kind of on your own right now, and and you know, doing freelance and stuff. Um, any plans on? joining a large corporation again or was you know debt or did the MLG experience maybe affect you in any any way I mean how was the MLG experience for you was it a good one or uh, yeah MLG experience was awesome um, I, I think that kind of the the thing that drew me away from that is is I mean I've never worked a, a straight up nine to five I've kind of been lucky that I have found jobs in uh, in esports that can kind of uh, support me in that way and uh, ultimately, I, I probably wouldn't have left MLG, but the, the New York uh, idea came up, or not idea, the, the idea of moving to New York came up. And uh, I, I'm just, I wasn't, I'd been to New York probably, I don't know, 10, 11 times prior to that. And it's great to, to visit, um, but I didn't want to live there. And in terms of joining another corporation, uh, for right now, it, I don't think it's it's kind of in my future. Um, maybe another corporation that's not a uh, a big league like that, or um, or a tournament, or, or anything like that, or any teams. I've always been actually pretty against teams. In fact, uh, there's been a lot of teams that have that have wanted to sponsor State of the Game in the past, and I've always said no. Um, and it, you can even see kind of why, because now. For a while there, a lot of the, the criticism of State of the Game is that it's the EG show uh, because we do always feature um, EG players on it, as Bass can, can attest, and I can attest <laughs> to the many phone calls from Bass that I've gotten in the past about it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Bass, the, the EG players are marketable, man. They, uh, they pick up good players that, that can talk very well on a show, and, and that's not criticizing any other players, but that's, that's one thing that a lot of teams, I think, uh, need, need to either start training or start looking at when you when you pick up a player because Idra, Jeff, the Muslim, they can all talk very, very well. Um, and, and that's definitely one of the biggest driving forces of having a lot of EG guys on the show. But uh, will I ever work for another tournament organizer? Probably not. If I do, it'll probably be MLG again. So, what, Would you work uh, like on a contract basis if, a, if an organization... You know, or an event wanted to have you come out there and do, you know, host host the event or something like that. Not long term, but just for that event. Is that something you'd be interested in? Um, probably not. I, I think that uh, the clutch or a uh, clutch or a too good would fulfill that role a little bit better. My my thing is that I I always I always want the best people doing their jobs, and and when I look at kind of a host role, um, I think that clutch and too good are very very uh, good at what they do, far better than I am. Um, so I, I hope that they would offer the job to them and not me. Um, Plus, you don't cuss or down. drink as much as too good. So, well, I mean, I mean, as as far as big fun, that, man. I definitely don't television. cuss as much as too good. I'll say that much. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, too good kind of has his that that's that's too good stick, and it's it's a good stick to have. Like people know what you're getting when uh, when you bring too good on a on a show or hosting gig. I was actually very surprised to, to kind of go off on a tangent. Um, with his work at the, uh, the the Invitational this past month, or I guess two weeks ago, because mm -hmm. um, he only I think he only said like two or three curse words, and it was it was very good uh, from his end of things. So, 
So a- any plans on um, spanning to different games? Um, I mean, I, I play a lot of other games. In, in terms of esports yep. games, um, I, I did a real talk with Toby One uh, from Dota fame, Dota 2 fame, and that went pretty well. Um, I, I definitely want to expand into League of Legends with Real Talk. That's kind of the the nice thing about having an interview show like Real Talk is that I can just jump into to other esports on a whim. Will I ever do like a state of the game or anything for these other these other games? Probably not. I, I think that that role is already filled uh, in a lot of the other other games. State of the League, I think, is um, is what League of Legends kind of has right now. There's probably some other podcasts that I'm not too aware of just because I don't know the scene that well. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of a lot of the other games, just aren't aren't worth it in, in the terms of the viewership they have. Like, if I did a Shoot Mania podcast, would that really get more <laughs> than ten thousand views? Probably not. Right. Um, it, it's just I, I do things kind of I, I look at a game and, and look at the viewership there and see if it's see if it's worth my time or see if that uh, is kind of if, if that gap has been filled yet. Um, so uh, right now, I just don't I don't see any other esports worth kind of jumping into, or any other games, sorry, within esports worth mm-hmm. jumping into. Okay, great. No, I mean, hopefully, a lot of folks, you know, uh, starting, you know, will start appreciating, I guess, you more in general. I mean, the folks that don't, you know, that have been hating on you before, and uh, I know real talk. I, I've all I've seen is just nothing but good stuff. Uh, real talk, especially from the community. So, because you're doing an awesome job, and and again, you know, obviously, I've been doing this, you know, much shorter than you, but um, you know, there's a lot of work that's involved in doing this, and you know, for the most part, you know, we do this for you guys and for the community, and you know, obviously, right. there there are ways to support the shows, but you know. We don't require you to do it, right? So, uh, you know, it's it's kind of sometimes it can be a thankless, but it's a you know it's a generous act, and I, I kind of always look at it as a generous. You know, these content producers are, are you know doing something very generous for the community. So, yeah. uh, I guess Mark just dropped off, so screen readers got messed up again. But we'll just use the pics for now until I fix it. Um, but I did want to kind of you know at this point kind of want to delve into Jason like the topics for you. Okay. And uh, I want to start off w- with, you know, just kind of what you're doing now. Obviously, you're, you're COO of Complexity and co-owner. And I um, wanted to talk about the relaunch and what you and Jason Lake kind of, um, what y'all's, I guess, mission statement or what y'all's uh, philosophy on, on building this team is right now. Um, you know, obviously, folks can just generally say, oh, it's about, you know, making money and building, you know, a team full of really great players. But it, I kind of want to get a little bit more details into to you know, how you're building this team? Well, we definitely have a focus on winning. I mean, that's definitely a cornerstone of everything that Jason Lake believes in, and I I echo his regard. Uh, We are currently, you know, trying to address what JP said with, you know, marketable players. We're doing a lot of good stuff out of the house, a lot of good content, and showing that, that our players are maybe a little more marketable and a little more well spoken than people give them credit for. Uh, so, I mean that that's always important. But uh, you know, as far as games and 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 things like that, you know, we've always been a multi gaming organization, and we focus mm-hmm. on, you know, where where the audience really is. I mean, you know, you get a lot of CS:GO comes out, and everybody comes out of the woodwork, and including people in our own organization, and like, yay, go get a team, go get a team. And I'm just like, hang on, let's uh, let's let's see what happens with the eyeballs, and before we we jump straight into that but you know at the end of the day we have hit a critical mass with Starcraft 2, League of Legends, Heroes of New Earth, Dota 2, they, they all get the types of numbers that our sponsors can actually uh, benefit from you know see the ROI from from actually sponsoring our organization from and so that's the most important thing right now in the past you know the you know Counter-Strike was big for its day but let's be honest I mean you know, some people playing on the ladder get more views than what the CPL finals used to do. I mean, the the economies of scale are just completely different now than they were back in the day for what we used to call successful. I mean, you know, back in the day, successful was ecstatic was ten to twenty thousand peak. You know, now you know you're you're crying if you hit less than like fifty or eighty. You know, so right. Jason, uh, could you imagine what it would have been like for us to have Twitch back then? No, I, I can't. Uh, but you know, I, I will say that uh, 
I think Twitch, I give it Twitch and owned and, and some of the other yeah. streaming platforms, just the advent of streaming has really opened this world up to everybody and it's really gotten us to where we are. But at the same time, JP mentioned something that I think that maybe a lot of people don't realize that I think overall some of the numbers are coming down now because of that 100 to 200 hours of content that's happening every single day. There's just such a saturation of mm -hmm. content and, and when MLG was doing the, the two StarCraft arenas, I'm just like, come on, guys. We're watching the same eight people play <laughs> for two straight months. I mean, yeah. who, can you imagine if the Dallas Cowboys were playing the Philadelphia Eagles three times a week? I mean, who would watch football anymore? That's, that's a problem that I think needs to be addressed and, and getting more of the, the special big event type of feel to come back that – you know these players come out and and, and it's it's special again it's not it's not oh well i just watched that last night you know I, I don't need to see it again today you know so that's that's one thing that i'm scared of with starcraft 2 is just the the fact that everybody has just so quickly jumped on the bandwagon that we get so much content going and and, and it just becomes a lot of white noise at this point in time and, and then tribes ascend is a terrible game i'm just just kidding <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh man <laughs> Uh, how how much of that, you know, what you just said there, do you think it is, is you know, in regards to not having this kind of governing body? Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on today, man. It's not you. It's Twitch. Is it? Yeah, they just announced, it, like, a new server. They're on a new oh, server God. or some shit. Uh, this is such this is so such a pain. I apologize, Jason. This is not usually how we run things, man. Uh, okay. I think we're back. All right, you guys hear us? Are we back? Refresh, guys. Let me tell them to refresh. Okay, we I'm might have to reiterate that. Here we go. Okay, I'm I think it's too. okay. I think it's back. All right, guys. I apologize for that. I don't know what's going on today with the servers, um, Twitter, oh, Twitch, or Skype, and I'm not sure what's going on. But um, let me rehash that same question again. And um, <laughs> Jason had such a great if answer. I, can actually repeat I know. The answer, no, I, it's going to suck. It's never <laughs> no. as good the second time. It's rehearsed now, right? No. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, so it, it so the question the question again was um, had to do with um, I, I think it, the issue was that there's just so much content right now, um, and it's getting overly saturated with the amount. You know, I think it's like 100 to 200 hours worth of content every day. And my question to I guess Jason was really um, would that get better or you know would these tournaments feel more special or uh, if if we if there was just this overlying governing body or if there was just this giant league um that something that riots tr i feel like is trying to do right now in, in their upcoming season three and jason's answer was <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll try to give this a shot again so uh at the end of the day it boils down to control it, it's mm -hmm. who who ends up having control of this governing body or, or what organizations are part of it. I mean, uh, you know, for instance, with Riot's, in Riot's case, you know, right now they may look like a benevolent benefactor that's coming in and doing, you know, great things, spending a lot of money supporting esports, supporting the team, supporting the players, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, what their intentions are today could be very different than what they are two years from now. And at that point in time, it can go from benefactor to dictator telling us what we can and can't do. I mean, we heard some of the rumors about teams not being able to keep any other MOBA titles. I mean, you know, whether true or not, that could very well be something that they wanted to do, and it could be very well something that they will do in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I see a possibility where the teams could unite in some sort of way and form some sort of organization. But, you know, we're... we're you have to move to more of a socialist mentality in order to make something like that work. You have to be working for the greater good and, and not more of a capitalist, which we all are right now, trying to fight for our, you know, piece of this small pie that's being handed out right now. And yeah. and when you get ten organizations in the room, because I've seen it with G8 in the past, you know, it's very hard to get everybody to agree. Mm -hmm. It's uh, almost impossible, honestly. And to try to come up with some sort of governing body that would. Uh, actually be able to affect some change and make us more saleable at a bigger level to bigger companies because if we unite we have much bigger numbers and a much yep. uh, bigger value proposition at that point in time than the individual pieces trying to get their piece of the pie but it's just really hard for 
everybody to be able to come to an agreement on what that should look like. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's lots of talk about it going around uh, from in different ways uh, around the esports scene right now, and and, and back rooms uh, that we're all a part of, and <laughs> we'll see what happens. But you know, it just uh, I think it it's for the best. Uh, I just don't know if it's possible or feasible right now. Yeah. I think to expand on that a little bit, I think by the end of 2012, we'll probably see a form of that um, that'll directly impact kind of StarCraft 2 and probably esports all, uh, everyone involved. So we'll just have to see because like, like Jason said, it's it's definitely backroom talks at this point. Um, but we'll have to see. I, I don't know how it's going to work. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. All right. Um, kind of, you know, continuing down the the complexity topics. Um, right now, for for complexity gaming, w when you talk about the totem pole for games, um, what what is the priority right now for for the games? Um, you know, what's what's at the top right now, and then kind of second, third, that type of. Uh... See, I think that's a mistake that a lot of organizations have made over time, and 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 us too. I mean, we've prioritized games, and frankly, there are a lot of great games right now. I mean, it, with a lot of great audiences, and when you have too much focus on one game, which obviously at the top of the totem pole for most organizations right now is StarCraft Two, unless you're, you know, in, in the MOBA scene and you're a CLG or and you're just, you know, that that's where you live, but. In the world that we're talking about right now, I mean, obviously StarCraft II is right at the top, but what I'm trying to change in our own organization is more of a, a balanced approach. Just we as a management team and as a staff need to focus on all of our games because we have a, an incredible Dota 2 team and quite possibly the best heroes and newer team in the world. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, one or two, you know, it just depends. We'll see it at DreamHack, but, uh, you know, so that there needs to be a lot of focus. I mean, we have our, we have our two best uh, or most popular uh, here's a new player moving into the house tonight, actually. So okay. we are starting to spread our wings outside of StarCraft II and uh, different areas and into the house. So that's a first. Yeah, that was kind of leading into my next question was, you know, really just asking you know, a little bit details about the complexity Gamma Gamer house and, uh, you know, whether non-StarCraft II folks would be moving in. And you just answer that question. That's, that's yeah. really great. Um, so with the house, uh, what are you planning? You know, what are some... You know, maybe some uh, plans that you have for the house right now. Are you are you all planning to do a lot more content coming directly from the house, or? Yeah, I mean, JP mentioned Mark Turner, Single Coil. He used to work for MLG. He worked for me at Gotfrag. He's JP, and all all three of us worked together for many, many years. He now works for us at Complexity. So he comes over once or twice a week and shoots some uh, live shows that we record, and and I mean, they're, we record them live and then air them at a later date. But we're, we're we are producing a lot more content and constantly coming up with new ideas, but I mean, the, tr the practice regimen that these StarCraft guys have put together and they've all agreed upon has really, I mean, it, it's great. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think everybody can agree that we saw some great improvement. I think yes. it, Complexity had its best MLG ever as far as StarCraft 2. I mean, no, we didn't win, but we had eight people in the top 32 uh, out of nine. So, I mean, that's, that's not too bad, including the top North American finisher in our, our academy player, Sasquatch. So uh, it was a good event, and I, and I think that the, their practice regimen is really really paying off, and I, I look forward to good things at them. They're all great guys, and I took them out to dinner uh, just this mm -hmm. past week uh, to celebrate uh, MLG and, and how well they did. So uh, I get together with them on not as much as I should, but it, you know, on a semi-regular basis. Yeah, I didn't think you guys got enough attention um, you know, regarding that because – those eight players, those are those eight players were all in the house too, right? Is that correct? Or all of our house players finished in the championship? Bracket. Yeah, in the I mean, that's and that's a huge but not thing. All, I mean. Not all eight players were in the house. I mean, Hart, oh, okay. uh, Hart and Gonzi both weren't in the house. Oh, Gonzi, as soon as his wrist gets better, he will be in the house. Uh, so yeah, but, but you know, again, like eight out of nine players. I mean, that's probably the most players I think any team's ever had in the championship bracket. So. Yeah, I didn't think you guys had you know got enough attention with uh, about that, and I kind of it kind of leads me up to a question of um, marketing right after tournaments. Um, you know what what's the best way, or, or what do you guys do in regards to that? Because um, you know I, I I was trying to tout it as much as possible for you guys, but you know I did, really didn't see that much um, outside of maybe Sasquatch being on a bunch of small smaller shows. Um, I didn't really see too much uh, marketing of it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, that's actually something that we're going to, uh, that we've been focusing on a lot lately is, is talking about that very aspect and our own messaging of, of how we do get behind, uh, you know, big events, you know, whether, whether or not, I mean, not everybody's going to win all the time, you know, and hey, we may not win ever, but Gonzi, I, I mean, uh, um, Hart, you know, he, his first Code S appearance, he just mm -hmm. made round of 16 today. I, that's that's yep. a big deal. Yep. You know, that's a that's a big deal for uh, Hart, and and we need to make a bigger deal out of it at complexity. Uh, and, and, you know, we've got Chris Luong, who's our player marketing manager. He, he re He's doing a great job of reaching out to different organizations and, you know, different podcasts and media outlets and getting lots of interviews done. But we as an organization need to do a better job at actually, you know, touting our own what, whatever we perceive as big news and, and, you know, lifting it up and, and making a bigger deal out of it. And I think that's something you that mean we You need to follow the EG model. Yes, definitely. Follow the EG model. Well, that they, they, they do a good job with well, their I brand want, I, They do. And I wanted to ask you about that because uh, there's no doubt that they do a very, very good job at marketing. I think it's pretty much been established that that's pretty much what they are, is a, a marketing group. They're not... I guess I don't look at them anymore, even as a team. Uh, I really don't. I just um, I don't know if maybe it's because all of their marketing has kind of overshadowed any results that they might end up getting. But one thing I've noticed about what Complexity is doing is they're doing it one a little bit like what Quantic's doing. Um, is they're doing it a little bit. They're going down this path a little bit slower and more steady, and they're they're really working on creating that. Uh, a team's uh, a team that's based off results first, and then getting to the point where they start to market um, your players. It just to me, it just seems like there's two different models that are going on here, and you guys are doing it one way, and EG's doing it another way. It doesn't mean that you can't pick up some of these little marketing tricks that they're pulling out and and that they're doing, uh, but that just doesn't seem to be your complexity's focus right now. Well, it has not been our focus, but I mean, this marketing is my background. That's what I do, and, and I, there are some internal things that I have to, uh, uh, you know, shift around to mentalities, you know, ways that they've always been done, so to speak. And there are things that we need to, to, to do to kind of pivot a little bit and, and do a little bit more on the marketing side. We are always going to be at the core, just like you said, building slowly, trying to organically grow, get the results, and, and be a top-notch team and let the wins speak for themselves. And, and we're getting better. You know, we, we will, we, we're on the stage more often and we're, we're getting better at that. And we, in other games, we are getting the championships and we are getting the wins. But we still do need to do a better job at, uh, I guess, selling our own news. You know, that's basically mm -hmm. what it boils down to. Shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So. All right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah, it's pretty interesting how how different you guys actually run. Um, I mean, you run y'all's teams, and you know, you, t you both of you guys are probably and including actually, if you had Mark here too, but you, you guys are probably the biggest North American teams, right? Especially StarCraft wise. So, um, do you guys ever? I mean, do you guys just pretty much, you know, put your head down and just kind of, you know, we're just we're continuing to do our own thing and, you know, trying to build winners and, and you know, with your roster, you know, I'm kind of leading up to this roster topic. How are you building your roster? Um, are you, you know, like how do you pick your players that you that you pick up? Because you know, obviously, a team like EG just picked up Stefano and they seem to be picking up the top players, just you know, as they're, you know, winning tournaments, which is a pretty good strategy actually. I mean, it might be an expensive strategy, but. Um, you know that that their their strategy seems pretty clear. Um, you know, I just want to ask you, like, what what is y'all's strategy in, in regards to that? Didn't you hear that Stefano announced on a French show that he's actually leaving EG and coming to join Complexity <laughs> after signing the contract? <laughs> oh, man. You didn't hear that one? I knew that no. was coming. All right. Uh, no. uh, so uh, that's a joke. In case you all don't know that, uh, that I was kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but. Uh, so, you know, we, we go through lots of different ways. I mean, you know, when we signed the MVP deal, we, I, I mean, I talked to JP at length, you know, before we, we did anything with MVP. You know, he, he's somebody I've gone to in the past for advice. You know, I'm, I'm an old man. I don't know a lot about this scene. I do watch. I've gotten better. Uh, but I rely on my own internal players. I, my player manager, Scott Ford, is uh, integral in helping us decide on players. And, 
you know, I get hit left and right by people asking to join almost on a daily basis. And, you know, I, with some of these Korean players, I, I just have to go look them up on Liquipedia. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, are they B-teamers, A-teamers? What are they? You know, I, I just because I haven't heard them doesn't mean they're not good. But mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you right now. It's out there. We're, we're looking for a Protoss, and, and it's going to be a Protoss for the house. So that's that's what we're looking for yeah. right now. And we've had lots of talks with lots of different people. We just haven't quite found the right fit yet. So that'll be the next player that we sign. Um, you know, uh, games are always a priority as well, and it's not just about StarCraft II. So we, we look at other up-and-coming games and see if you know CS:GO is something we need to look at, or, or League of Legends obviously is something we need to be looking at, but you know, the top teams seem to be kind of locked up, and that's kind of an area I think that EG and us have kind of been in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you need to, when you have a brand like ours, you need to be at least in contention. You can't be number eight or number nine. You know, you need to be at least in the top five. So, mm -hmm. um, but that that's really what it boils down to, is... Uh, Talent, personality is definitely a, a factor of it, especially if they're coming to the house right now. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately results. I mean, I'm not looking to go out and buy the guy who won the last event because, uh, you know, frankly, that just inflates their cost. Uh, you know, and and uh, I, I don't like to play the bidding game. I think that there's a, a good fair market value, and, and some organizations have uh, blown that market value out of the water and, and created an artificial market, but... Uh, there is still a good fair market value for most of these players, and, and we try to stick in that that price range. Mm -hmm. uh, how integral is the academy for you guys right now in in really growing new talent and in building? You know, quite honestly, the NA scene. <coughs> I mean, the NA scene obviously needs uh, needs to kind of catch up, I think, in regards to some of the others. Yeah, I mean, it's my firm belief that you know I, I have seen RTS come and go very rapidly in the United States of America over the last 15 years, and it's because we lose interest because the Koreans just dominate it and and we just don't, and then the fans tune out and then suddenly RTS is just a non-factor in North America unless you're watching, you know, Kespa or, or something else overseas, and my firm belief and that's the reason why we created the academy is that we need to foster this North American talent and show people that there is a a route to get into a professional organization and actually get on that stage and do some stuff and we've had some great success with GoSu User, uh, Sasquatch and and. Uh, um, Fuzzy. Fuzzy. Fuzzy, was, uh, Fuzzy lost a killer, and, and killer went to, we had a team kill to go to the champ bracket. So, I mean, he did really, really great at, the, uh, at MLG. So, I think we're doing some good results. You're going to see some new, new things coming out, a larger fo focus on the academy, more of its own property, if you will, with maybe its own sponsors, things like that. Uh, it, it's going to be a much bigger thing and a much bigger focus for us in, in the months to come. Uh, because I do believe for esports and StarCraft in general, it's a it's a very very important initiative for uh, to foster this talent and, and give it a, a a place to to grow. All right. Well, I think we're we're actually through all the topics that I was planning on doing. But I I usually like to end it kind of like we start with misconceptions. I like to end it with um kind of a brainstorming, just a real quick brainstorming session with, and this is like to bring up any ideas you guys might have had that aren't your secret, you know, money making crazy ideas. But but they're just more of like you know improving the industry type of ideas that you'd like to see maybe in your segment or even just another segment. Um, you guys have anything here? 13 tournament in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, how Damn it. <laughs> what? It went out. Oh, the the stream went out? Yes. Oh, God. All right, let me restart it. This is like a nightmare day, dude. Thir the worst day ever. Okay, let's see if the stream's back up. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's just Twitch or if it's Skype, actually. Cause it's got to be Twitch. Or combination of the two. Because we're still on the call. Yeah, well, Jason kind of. I'm here. Yeah, he just. Yeah. I guess he had just had to restart his video. Okay, I think we're back on, right? Is my video on or no? Yeah, your video is back on. Okay. All right, sorry about that, guys. Yeah, I think I don't. Know, John was saying like Twitch announced some issues, right, with servers. So maybe well, the they server didn't announce issues. They just announced yeah. that they did a bunch of, uh, bunch of changes. Should have Gun Run on here as a host, Link. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good strategy. Anytime we have an issue, just have them go take a look for us. But um, 
Yeah, so, anyway, so anyways, I'm introducing this portion of the show, which is really about brainstorming. And, and again, it's about just really discussing any ideas that you might have that might improve, that help improve the industry and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you usually start with John. John usually has something. But, uh, <laughs> on how we can improve the industry? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. One thing, I was just, we were just talking in the, in the chat. I know this came up before, and it always gets a little heated. But, I mean, not too much. But uh, Well, first I wanted to comment that uh, being a, a premier-level soccer coach and working within soccer clubs, um, you always run into different teams that you're always like, they're, they're always your nemesis, you know. And uh, there's always uh, talk between the different clubs. I mean, I, I look at soccer clubs as very much like um, – teams or different organizations, you know, they all do something different and one's, you know, touted as the best in the city and the other is just like a, a low level. But um, there was always this, this, this kind of, I don't know if it was a running joke, but this conversation about how this, this one club and this one team, they bought their team and then other teams built their teams. Uh, and that is definitely happening in, in, in StarCraft, and, and uh, I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know why. I think it's goes going back on, on how complexity is doing things differently than other, other organizations might be doing it with their academy, which I think is just uh, awesome. I think it's exactly uh, his answer to that question was, um, was, it, was right on key. Um, Let's see. But what was brought up was, you know, so and so. Uh, EG is the best team. Quantics the best team. Complexity is the best team. And it just baffles me every time that people can say that because we have no team leagues. How can anyone tell? It's frustrating as hell. And every single tournament that we have where teams are involved is, uh, is you know, all kill crap. And that you can't tell whether a good, you know, who has the best roster from top to bottom. If you took the top seven players from one team and the top seven players from another team and you had them play in such a way in which you could really tell what was the strongest team uh, I'd be curious to see who, who it would be. Yeah, we're talking like a team tennis format type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, enough of this. One guy gets in and he is without a doubt better than let's say six of the other guys on the other team or seven of, or all seven and he just wins four games in a row and it's over and mm. You know, yay, uh, Quantic's the best team. Well, Qu Quantic didn't win it. Just one guy won it. You know, it's just frustrating. Sorry. I just was going off there for a minute for a tangent. But you no, asked I, me a question. I, I, <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I definitely agree with you. I, I mean, I think I mean, I'm plug EG again. I think their Master Cup <laughs> series does a, a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not exactly what you're talking about, John, but it's mm -hmm. at least not an all-kill format, and it takes a... There's a, I know there's a lot of strategy that we go into trying to guess who they're going to play, when they're going to play them, and what right. map they're going to be on so that we try to put our best counter in there. And I mean, We won that thing last season, and you know, we'll see how it goes this season. But yeah, isn't uh, that fun? I mean, that's part of the game. That's like a baseball coach. And I, I hate baseball, but that's like a baseball coach <laughs> who, or manager that's got to pick his lineup, and he, and he really picks his lineup based on the other team and the pitcher and things. And there's just – that's – uh, to me, that's just fun. I mean, we need more of that. Maybe it's just because I yeah. miss the days of actual team sports, yeah. team <laughs> sports, you know, like CTF, uh, CS, um, you know, well, where there was a coach standing behind you yelling his, you know, your ear off um, yeah. about what needed to be done. That was cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, I e ESEA does that, right? Um, I think that's the only l league, I mean, team tournament, I think, that has that similar format. Um... Don't they have that format where they just... No. Are you, isn't Complexity in the ECA League? The Academy is. Uh, the Academy but they, Yeah, they, 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 they have something similar to EG's format, I believe. It doesn't okay. end in... Well, it doesn't, EG's doesn't end in 2v2 it, anymore either, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it's similar to that. It's not, it's not an all-kill format. Okay. Uh, but I'm not positive off the top See, of and I that. think, And the reason I always bring this up is... is well, because I'm a big sports guy, and I just it's just an issue with me. But, but also, I, I wonder if is if we started to do that more, if it really did start to be about the team, and not just the player, or not just about how we can best market each player within our team, but it was be about the team itself. Um, you might end up finding that players stick around longer. There's more loyalty to teams. Um, that 
that the community gets on board more with the team as opposed to players. And I, I, I don't know. I just I think it would be really interesting to see if there was a shift in that. And I hope, you know, CSN is obviously going to roll out some StarCraft II leagues very soon, um, and we'll definitely do things differently um, in, in, in hopes that it may, might change things a little bit. But we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess one brainstorming thing I'd throw out there is, uh, you know, I, I, I know people complain about this a lot, but why can't the leagues and tournaments just try to coordinate their schedules just yes. a little bit? Uh, so yes. No and it's not on a holiday, and it's not, uh, you know, whatever. It's just always uh, such a pain. And then, <laughs> and then you know, from a team or from an organization that has to spend a ton of money on travel, why do we have to go like two months in a row with nothing, and then we have six events in the same month? I mean, that, that's yeah. just obnoxious to me. But, yeah. yeah, I think that the uh, the governing body that you kind of mentioned earlier can can solve a lot of the the or at least the two issues you just brought up in terms of scheduling. They could definitely have a cohesive schedule that that kind of flows easier for teams in terms of spending cash to get players where they're they're supposed to go and whatnot. And also the that I. Team leagues to me have always been kind of weird because I, I don't view teams as like a baseball or a soccer team. I view them more as agencies for these players. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we had like a um, some sort of ranking system, which I think the, a large organization with everyone in it can kind of solve, where it, it's players are ranked globally in terms of a kind of like the I think Sundance, and I don't know if this was a, a public press session that he did, but it, it was at uh, Raleigh was mentioning something like, um, I think what the PGA uses in terms of their ranking system. Yeah. And uh, if we had that for players, that that would definitely help. But the team leagues, to me, are always just so weird. Because like like John was saying, that if a, play, or if a team wins, it's usually on the back of one or two players doing very, very well. It's not the team winning. And maybe, maybe the, the team aspect of that lies on the coach throwing in that player at that specific time. But... We never see that interaction from a viewership point of view. We never see, maybe in GSL a tiny bit, that Coach X threw in this player at this point. In in the EG Masters Cup, we just see, oh, well, the next player for complexity is so-and-so. So, So I I don't know. Team leagues are kind of... I've lost interest in them because of that. Uh, Because I think as time goes on, the teams are going to kind of fill the agency role a lot more than this, this team idea, which is almost an archaic idea right now to me in esports. Yeah, I mean, the, the team, obviously, team and team leagues in StarCraft uh, it has a lot to do with, obviously, Brood War and, and Pro League and just just all the success they've had there, right? But I, I, I'm totally there with you. I mean, I, I feel like StarCraft 2 has always been more of an individual sport than, uh, than a team sport. And, um, I mean, we, we've never had a live event that's a team event, right? I mean, just because there's, it'd just be too many matches. I mean, I don't even know how you would facilitate all of that right um but it, i mean I, I think it's still possible i mean I, I think teams you're right are marketing agencies for the most part but um is it possible i i feel like it is possible to create that that I, feeling it's just it takes it'll think, take work i mean i think the individual nature of starcraft has made us more of a sponsor or a marketing agency i can tell you at the international we're definitely viewed as a team. At, yeah, uh, totally. Definitely you know, true. In Heroes of New Earth, we are viewed as a team. I mean, that's one thing I miss about Counter Strike dearly is that, you know, yes, people knew who Fraud was and who Storm were, but it was complexity. That that's what it was, you know. And that's that's very true. You know, I love StarCraft too, but we are definitely much more of an agency and sponsor mm-hmm. sponsor mm-hmm. in that game. But in other games, we are very much a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a good point. Yeah, there are pros and cons to both sides of that equation, but. I mean, one one example of a recent event where you know the team field had you know had some impact was the IPL event where you know Liquid again and MVP I think was it MVP or was it the IM team? I forget. You know, it, was the, it was the IM, yeah, IM versus Liquid. I mean that I you know I could feel the team aspect to that, but that had a lot to do with the the you know the actual content that was being shown to viewers, right? I mean, we got a good we had, we had a, a lot of a lot of content where it showed the teams, it showed, you know, just the, the interaction between all the teammates and, and that sort of thing. And then obviously the Tasia, you know, as sad as it was for him, I mean, that shot of him and all the players trying to console him, I think, you know, that that had impact, I think, um, from that standpoint. But That, that aspect, of it, I felt like that that event was just Tasia versus I am. And yeah. I think I'm, I'm not alone in, in yeah. that. It, mm-hmm. 
it was very it wasn't boring by any means because it was basically Teja versus four of the, I think it's they have ten champion or no that's with SK it's like seven or eight championships between seed Nest T and MVP but <laughs> yeah yeah um, it, it was it was definitely interesting to see that but I, again I, I think that that was it, it was a team league format and kind of an individual sport with, yeah. with Starcraft which I think is what Jason made a good point to mm-hmm. kind of go back to that yeah. One thing that's been said in the chat that, that John, I mean, uh, I, I don't remember, somebody mentioned earlier buying versus, uh, you know, kind of growing talent. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with buying talent. If mm-hmm. I want to go out and buy somebody that's at the right price, I'm going to do it. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, at our core, we do believe in fostering, you know, relatively unknown talent that, that hopefully proves us right. A lot of times proves us wrong, but, you know, heart. Nobody knew who that guy was before we signed him. Uh, you know, very few people did. But he went out and got what second or third at MLG. That I think it was third, but third at MLG that uh, go around his very first time out. And you know, I mean, we, we we just believe in trying to get these up and coming guys. And you know, I'm going to be honest. It's it's because it's at a lower price point most of the time. Uh, but we we will we are willing to go out and buy talent. We did Naniwa. We did. Stefano, it lasted for 12 hours, but we did it. Uh, but, uh, that was the most expensive you know, 12 hours ever. It really was uh, for Millennium. But, uh, for Millennium. Was, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, there's nothing wrong with buying talent. I mean, there, there, nothing at all. That's what we do, and, and that's the market we're in one way or another. We are buying it. It's just a matter of that what dollar value we're buying it at. Right. All right, guys. Why don't we take some questions from all the viewers? And the the way you guys um, will you know kind of participate in Q and A is add me on Skype. My Skype ID is ShamMV. Been having issues with the ad too for Skype. It, like yesterday, I was doing Pro Corner, and all the requests came like three hours later. So uh, something it's something kind of weird there. But I know messaging me directly in Skype um, is instant. So just go ahead and message me ShamMV, and uh, we'll pull you in this call. But we always start off with good old Kurt Key Hunt. And let's, let's get his. I'm sure he has a lot to say here, <laughs> knowing Kurt. Right, I hope he changed his picture from the executives because that was not pretty. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you can ask him about that. <laughs> Already Kurt. talking shit. Just join the channel. God. What's up, Kurt? What's up, guys? How are you doing? Good. Good, good. Got a question? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. JP, I apologize. My question is not going to be pointed towards you for this thing. I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I do have a question for you, for you, Jason. And, and you know how long I've been around. I've been wrong for a while. Around for a while. Same for JP. So I think he'll he'll understand this as well. Uh, it, it, uh, my main question relates back back to Complexity's history, and what an amazing history you guys have. Like. The entire story. I mean, I mean, in in all actuality, and I feel like that is incredibly non-existent in this community anymore. No one really knows. Um, are there any strives and complexity to make that story a little more known? And you know, because you guys, you guys aren't like other teams. You have a story that sh- you know deserves to be showcased. You know. No, I definitely agree. I mean, like I said, it's it's we're doing a pivot right now, and we're trying to figure out what what our message should be and what our consistent message should be. And I, I agree with you. I think our history is something that people should be educated on. Maybe we need to do a documentary like Generations where it talks more about our history so people don't have to go back and find about it. I mean, sometimes, you know, we it almost feels like when we talk about our history, we're, we're almost having to forum troll and retort to some jerk who doesn't know anything about us or something like that. But I, I do think that we need to get that that message out there because we do have a long storied history and we do have a history of picking up people that are relatively unknown and, and turning them into stars. And, and uh, I mean, that started with Counter-Strike. Jason did a great job with that original team and uh, it's continued on through through other things that we've done over the years. And I, I do think that it's uh, a story that needs to be told to an uh, almost a, at least a new demographic, but an, almost a new generation of, of uh, gamers. Yeah, I, I I think it's important. And like I said, I mean, other teams have that story. It's just very, it's very, very different. Yours is mm-hmm. uh, complexities is very, very different, and unique. So, um, last question, quick question is, I'm just always been kind of curious. Does Jax, Alex Conroy, 
does he still own a piece of the company with complexity? Is he? I know he's not an active part anymore, but does he still own a piece? Just out of my curiosity. Um, yes, so he still owns a piece of the company. He's uh, no longer active in uh, an active management role, but he still is part owner of the company. Gotcha. I was just curious about it. All right, guys, that's it. All right, thanks, Kurt. Take care, guys. Yep. Wow, that was tame. Yeah, no, tame he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got Jordan up next. Hey, Jordan, you there? Yeah, I'm here, guys. Hey, welcome to Climbing the Ladder. You got a question? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm getting some feedback on my end. Sorry about that. Yeah, just mute the stream. Especially <laughs> the... All right, so um, my question would be from a gaming organization standpoint, how come we don't see more promotional events from the gaming teams themselves outside of sponsorships? And that can be for anyone in the channel, since I know most of you run your own gaming team. So you mean more about like, like a complexity branded tournament, or or just ones that we run? That, or or having a booth at E three, doing your own sort of brand information. Well, you know, at the end of the day, our core business is is marketing for our partners, and uh, you know, so we do need to start investing more in marketing our own brand I would actually agree with you I just don't think we've reached a, a revenue critical mass to be able to to do it effectively and not maybe come off looking shoddy so right now we we tend to piggyback off of initiatives of our of our sponsors you know we, we've done several events for uh, creative labs for the tactic cup tournaments you know for mm -hmm. League of Legends and <clears throat> Starcraft 2 and we'll be doing several more of those over the months to come and and we get we get some branding on that but I mean I, I, I hear what you're saying and I agree with it uh, I just think that it's been a, a priorities of where to spend our money and we're still very much in an organic stage right now and it's hard to go uh, pitch our partners that, that we should brand our own tournament if you will and they should funnel more money into that direction uh, EG has been able to successfully do that, but I, I think that that would be that's a great thing that they've done. We just have not been able to successfully uh, make that pitch, I guess. Okay, and then uh, I guess same question goes to John, since I know that CSN runs their own tournaments and that they've been trying to do uh, more for other games outside of esports or trying to get um, more casual games involved with esports. So same question. So you're asking, you know. Why doesn't CSN do more for CSN? Is that what you're? Yes. Okay. Uh, honestly, it's it's a matter of revenue. I mean, most all of the tournaments that CSN runs, uh, you know, there are actually some people out there that that know who CSN is, and those that do, a lot of them think that we're rolling in the dough, and that's just not the case at all. Almost every tournament that CSN runs online. Uh, the pricing comes from either the developers or a sponsor or actually believe it or not in some cases we are approached by individuals who who say hey uh, you know I'd like to run or I'd like somebody to run a, a quake live tournament here's a here's 150 200 bucks you know put it towards the tournament uh, you'd be surprised but that happens a lot so you know if let's say CSN had 50 million dollars in all right should be back <laughs> Let's make sure. <laughs> See now it cut out. Apparently, it cut out when I said it'd be nice if we had fifty million dollars. <laughs> in DC. That's what we have. Perfect. We are <laughs> at on purpose, man. Great. See, I knew CSM was rolling in money. <laughs> yeah. Not sharing. Yeah. I mean, if that was a yeah, that's not at yeah. all the case. It's gonna be the uh, video. It's gonna be the video clip, man. Okay, I think we're back up now. Okay. Well, anyway, just to re, just to make it clear, uh, CSN does not have fifty million dollars in VC. We we barely have uh, five hundred dollars in VC. Uh, we are doing a lot of things as we as we move forward to to work with different developers, different sponsors. Uh, Jordan, are you still on the call? Yeah, I'm still here. Like yourself, uh, when we did uh, the ASIO Rundown Cup, uh, mm -hmm. Rundown World Cup. So. 
we work with a lot of sponsors and developers right now. I base, I think basically to get to continue to get our brand out there and to continue to get a, a user base. And then once we can start to generate our own revenue, a lot of that will go right back into to more CSN branded stuff. Okay. All right. Great. Right. All right. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, guys. All right. Silent Dolphin. Silent Dolphin. NESPS. And guys, uh, you know, if you want to call in, go ahead and message me on Skype. My Skype ID is ChamMV. Uh, I think the adding contact thing isn't working right now, so best way to do it. Hey, Hello? are you there? Yep. Hey, welcome to Climbing Ladder. All right, thanks. Uh, my question is can be answered by anyone, but <clears throat> it's mostly referring to uh, how before you were talking about how you wanted, you liked how like team oriented things. And stuff. So I was just wondering, why aren't there more like two v two leagues or like three or like multiple player leagues? Why is StarCraft mainly a one versus one league? Like, does it have to do with balance or something? Or like, what do you guys think? It's a purest thing, probably. If I had yeah, to I agree. It's like in 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 my experiences uh, growing up or understanding Quake, one v one is like the the ultimate. Um, just battle, and, and, it, and it requires the the most dedicated skill. And then you know, it's not that two v two doesn't. Uh, you know, two v two in in Quake is the same sort of thing. It's just kind of like secondary. Uh, Duel is just considered for that game, and I think it, it, the same goes for StarCraft. Um, it's simply just the most purest form of competition between uh, between two players in StarCraft. Like. It's I under okay I understand like it's a duel between like one person person versus another person but would it not still be viable to have at least like two versus two leagues? Oh like, yeah, it absolutely would be. I think it becomes gimmicky though, and I think that's how a lot yeah. of the community uh, perceives it because I, I equate StarCraft a little closer to poker than I do to tennis because it, you know it really is a mental game and it's uh, there's a lot of uh, guessing and trying to get it right and you don't see a team of two people playing poker against another two team of people playing poker. I mean, I think it takes a, a completely different dynamic and, and almost a different skill set in some ways to be good at 2v2. I mean, let, uh, you know, I, back in the day when, when we had Druby and Katz, I mean, they, they were the predominant 2v2 team, but honestly, when it came to 1v1, they didn't do very well. So... Uh, it's just a different dynamic, and uh, and I think that a lot of these pros are focused on where the money's at, and I think for uh, occasional one-offs and, and things like that, I think that a 2v2 is a great, uh, fun change of pace, but I, I think it's more perceived as a novelty that I don't think would ever really catch on in a serious way. It would take some money and some sort of serious organization running some sort of 2v2 event for it to catch on, and I'm not even yeah. sure it would then either. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it has some, I don't know, there, there's some it, some kind of appealing aspects to it because, you know, the thing with StarCraft is that, you know, you do have different races and com having the combinations of each race can create a whole, you know, different monster itself, you know, as, as far as, uh, you know, well, what, you know, what units and what, you know, uh, just the synergy in units and that sort of thing on a team. But, yeah, if, definitely there's not much interest in it, so nobody's doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thanks for the question, buddy. All right, you're welcome. Thanks right. for having me. Yep. Okay, let's... Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> oh, man, sorry about that. <laughs> Why don't we do shout-outs? Okay. Uh, JP, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Check me out uh, on twitch.tv slash MAJP streaming every day. Still don't have a schedule yet, though. Uh, State of the game's dead till I bring it back. Uh, Real talk, still trying to do it every week, um, but a lot of scheduling there as well. Um, so if I miss a week or if I'm off by a couple days, I apologize. But uh, that can all be found on youtubecom slash jp Subscribe to it; it really helps. And uh, that's that's all I got. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you, JP. Hi, Jason. Yeah, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at, at, at Jason Bass. Uh, I want to thank Complexity Sponsors, Sound Blaster, Gamma Gamers, QPad, PNY Origin, and, uh, uh, you know, just thanks for having me on the show. It's been uh, fun, and 
I hope people enjoyed it. Hi, right, John, you're up. Uh, I'll, I'll do the Twitter thing. You can follow me on CSN <laughs> underscore John Clark uh, if you care to. I'm always up for good conversation. And uh, other than that, just thanks uh, to all the those those of you that tuned in today, and thanks to our guest. Uh, actually, it was a good conversation today. It's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, a big you know, of course, big thanks to JP and, and Jason for coming on. I mean, I apologize for all the technical issues today. I mean, this is like crazy day, but. Uh, um, you know, again, hopefully you guys were able to catch it. And I'll try to piece together this VOD. It's going to be a nightmare piecing together this VOD. But uh, I'll try to th get this up by, I don't know, later tonight. I don't envy you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, JP feels my, my pain. But, uh, but uh, let's see. Next week we have, um, let's see, next Tuesday we have F FXO Boss. Uh, Josh, oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on his last name. Josh... Uh, what is it? It's uh, Josh oh, Dentrinos. Gosh, man, <laughs> totally. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna have another guest. I'm gonna try to get an, a player on to um, you know, as a second guest. So I'll fill you guys up on that. Uh, just follow me on Twitter at twitter.com/slash/chamavita for the for the updates. And uh, obviously, big big thanks to John too and Mark for I guess for the five minutes he was on the show. But uh, yeah, that's gonna be it for climbing the ladder this week, guys. We'll see you later. Peace. Peace.